begin reading here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 at verse 10, and I'll read to verse 17 and get into our study. Paul writes, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, as we enter into this passage here and we pick up at verse 10, Paul has been outlining conditions that would exist uh, in uh, the time just prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Now, in some ways, these conditions would exist because the church had been infiltrated. The combination of False teachers and bad doctrine has produced a weakness. And so his exhortation as he's continuing what he has just been writing to Timothy would be simply this. Timothy, you're a genuine teacher, so remain firm and steadfast in your doctrine. Now, that's what he has been doing. That's why Paul in verse 10 can say to him, you, but you have carefully followed my doctrine. That's because he's encouraging him. He's exhorting him to remain faithful in the things that he has learned from the apostle Paul. You, in other words, are distinct from the false teachers because you're sincere. You're a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. You have been a true disciple. See, Paul is getting ready to lay down his life. He's, he knows that his, his time is short and that it's time that he's going to end up going to be with the Lord in heaven and all. And so he's encouraging him in this way. In a way, he might be saying to him something like this. He may be saying to him, Timothy, I showed you how to live and now I'm encouraging you so that you may know how you may die. Paul in chapter 4 is going to be speaking concerning his time of departure being at hand. In other words, he knows that he's about to go and, and be with the Lord. And so what he's doing is he's equipping his young protege, the young man that he's been mentoring, a, a genuine son in the faith. He's equipping him for works of service. That's what he's doing here. And, and he's saying to him, you can use me as a model. I want you to notice how he says, you have carefully followed. Now, notice the first two things, and we'll look at this in some detail in a moment. But notice he says, you have carefully followed my doctrine and manner of life. Doctrine and manner of life. Christianity is more than simply a, a set of rules and regulations. It's more than a moral code. It's more than a system of ethics. It's, it's deeper than a simple philosophy. Christianity is something that is not only taught, even as we look at the Bible and try and find points in it that we can, we can understand the ways of God and, and then yield to and, and have information concerning the things of God and all. It's not simply something that is, is coming to you in this form where I open the Bible and speak to you, but it is something that is also not simply taught, it is also caught. And the way that it is caught is by learning a manner of life. That's why the first two things that he speaks about here is my doctrine and manner of life. The things that I have taught you and the way that I have lived in front of you. And that's what Paul is speaking about here. To the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1, Paul could write, imitate me as I also imitate Jesus Christ. And Paul is using himself as an example of what a believer is to, to believe as well as how a believer is to behave. Some things you can learn through books and all. Some things through necessity you have to learn through books. Other things you can learn through a combination of, of, uh, of uh, this kind of teaching, speaking and reading and all, and doing. For example, when you learn to drive a car, you probably had a combination of the two. You had to go, if you, if you had to, I had to go to... Uh, to classes where they teach you the theories and everything about driving. They show us films and, and all of that. So there was one thing they could teach you when you climb into a driver's seat. You're supposed to, you know, set the, the seat at a comfortable place. You're supposed to have your hands in, you know, 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock and all of that. You, how to turn the car on. All of this is theory until you get behind the wheel. And then when you get behind the wheel, the theory is supposed to become practical.
practice. That's how it works. And, and the more you drive, the better you drive, hopefully, over time. That's how it's supposed to work anyway. And so driving is that way. Some things you learn through lecture as well as doing. All things are going to be learned by doing, though. You're going to have to put these things into practice. And that's what Paul is speaking about here. He's saying you have become somebody who has learned not simply the doctrine in the sense of being able to to assent to certain things that I've taught to you about uh, Jesus Christ, God, the Bible, heaven, hell, salvation. You have ascended to those things, but you've also seen how a Christian lives. And that's what Paul begins to speak about here. During the time of Christ, as well as the time of Paul, first century rabbis would actually raise up disciples with a certain methodology. In discipleship, during the time of Paul, a disciple was one who would follow a teacher. He would make his mind up to follow a teacher. Then that disciple would begin to memorize the words of their teacher. They would learn the way of ministry. Then they would imitate life and character. And ultimately, they would themselves begin to train up other disciples. That's what Paul is alluding to in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, when he said in that verse, the things uh, that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so Paul has been the mentor in the life of Timothy. This young pastor has used Paul as an example. And there are certain things that, that he has carefully followed. Paul begins to share those things for us in verses 10 and 11. He says, you have carefully followed my doctrine. When he speaks of doctrine, that speaks of my teaching. You have carefully followed my teaching concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have carefully followed my manner of life. In other words, you have seen the way that I live amongst the people. You have seen my priorities. You have seen my unselfish consecration. And you have followed my manner of life. You have followed my purpose. When he speaks about his purpose, that's my chief aim in life. That's the thing that makes me what I am. Every individual, in other words, has a master passion. Jesus taught us that this is true. And he said, you just need to make a decision what your master passion is going to be. You cannot serve two masters. You have to choose to cling to one and discard the other. You cannot hold fast to God and you cannot hold fast to the enemy. You have to decide who you're going to cling to. That's something you find from the time of the Old to the New Testament. Joshua says, choose this day whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so there's a master passion in your life. There is, there is something that motivates you. What is it? What is it that causes your heart to beat fast? What is it that you think about, that you do, that you want to do? You want to do better. What is it? Well, for Paul, he'd be saying, you know my purpose. You know my chief aim. You know my goal. You know, as I said to the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You know that. You know the purpose of my life is to love God with everything that is within me and to learn to love others as I love myself. You know that Jesus Christ has taught us that you know my purpose in life. You know my chief aim. You know my faith. You know my faith towards God. The faith that I have towards God that has resulted in my salvation. You know my long suffering, which is my patience. The patience that I've had with people, especially the patience that I've had with people who have persecuted me. You know that I've endured with a long suffering attitude. You know my, you know my persecutions that I've gone through throughout my entire ministry. You're familiar with them. You know the afflictions that I've gone through for the sake of Jesus Christ. You know the pain that I've endured. You know about what happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium. You know what happened in Lystra. That's what he's referring to there in verse 11 when he speaks of those persecutions that Timothy would be familiar with because that's where Timothy had been saved and thus would understand that. But he also goes on to say this in verse 11. He says concerning persecutions, concerning afflictions that he endured, and this he says, out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now that's something that I marked in my scriptures. I marked that down. Out of them all, the Lord delivered me because God faithfully preserved him. He went in, but he also came out. And that's how it works in the things of the Lord. 